Uh, so my title is He Bonikala, Language Contact and Experiences of Swahili Among Rural Datoga Children. Uh, just a little bit of background about me. I'm a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology at the University of Bristol. Um, I'm working on a multidisciplinary project looking at cross-cultural diversity in kinship systems at the moment. Um, my PhD was on the uh, avoidance register of the Datoga language and uh, I, I'm still still working with Datoga speakers. Okay, so um, in the talk I'm going to be looking at Datoga speaking children's knowledge, use and experience of the Swahili language in a rural pastoral village in the Ida Valley of Tanzania. So the goal of this preliminary study is to understand more about the contemporary linguistic ecology in which Datoga is spoken, um, as well as to look at the, the dynamics of language contact in rural Tanzania um, more broadly, and hopefully also say something about the role that children play in language contact and potentially in language change. So as we'll see, the national language Swahili uh, shapes the experience of even very young Datoga children uh, though in quite marginal ways in this particular case study. So I'll start off by telling you a little bit about uh, Datoga, then about the data and, and the methods used in this study. Then we'll have a look at Datoga speaking children's use of Swahili words. And finally, uh, I'll talk about what I'm calling make-believe Swahili. Okay, so the Datoga language, it belongs to the Southern Nilotic language family. Um, it's primarily spoken in northern Tanzania, though increasingly now it's also found in, in more southern parts of the country as uh, people migrate in search of pasture for herding their cattle. Datoga are traditionally semi-nomadic pastoralists. Um, nowadays, many of them have become more sedentary. They also uh, practice some agriculture these days, though cattle remain very important in Datoga society. Okay, sorry. Um, so Datoga is a dialect cluster. Um, the, the dialects that I'm going to be talking about today are Gisamjanga and Barabaig, which are eastern dialects of Datoga, and um, they're pretty mutually thousand speakers of Datoga, um, though many of my Datoga friends and collaborators think that there's actually there should be there's probably many, many more than that. Um, so in the context of Tanzania, it's a, a medium-sized language. As I said, I'm going to be looking at the influence of Swahili on Datoga children's speech. So I'll just say a little bit about Swahili as, as a contact language. Um, as you all know, I'm sure Swahili is the national language and the lingua franca of Tanzania. And according to one rather old estimate, some 90% of the population speaks Swahili. So of the remaining 10% who, who don't speak Swahili, we can assume that this includes mostly young children uh, who've not yet started school. Uh, Leger writes that school entrants in rural areas up country are frequently found to have limited or no competence in Swahili. Um, I think I also include rural older women in that 10%. Um, I'll talk a, a little bit about that later on. Uh, we also know that Swahili is influencing many other Tanzanian languages, um, so I've just listed a, a couple of relevant studies here. I'm not aware of any published research yet on Datoga Swahili contact. Um, according to an SIL estimate from 1993, 5% of Datoga speak Swahili. Um, I, I, it's a bit difficult to estimate, but I would predict that's a much higher proportion um, speak Swahili now in 2019. From my field work, I've observed that men tend to have um, higher Swahili competence than women, and that's because they spend more time at markets and um, in, you know, in town. Uh, other factors that will influence Swahili knowledge are things like whether you go to school, um, the proximity of your household to, to towns or more urban areas, and the ethnic makeup of the village that you live in. Um, so the, this case study was, um, the research was conducted in a village that's primarily uh, made up of Datoga, so you know, you're hearing a lot of Datoga even outside of the compounds. Um, broadly speaking, Datoga is spoken at home, whereas Swahili will be spoken um, at the market, on buses, in hospitals, in towns, in, in institutional contexts, and so on. Um, and like many other languages, there are um, 
you know, there's plenty of borrowing going on from Swahili. Uh, and we'll have a look at a few examples of this in children's speech in just a moment. So this preliminary research on children's Swahili knowledge is based on a case study of a single household uh, located in uh, a pastoral village in the Yaida Valley in Mbulu district. The data come from participant observation that I conducted in this household over the course of nine months in 2017. Um, children's spontaneous language use. So I uh, recorded, um, I can't remember quite how many hours, something like 40 hours of family interaction in this household. And that's the data that I'll be drawing on today. Um, so this is just showing you where the case study household is located. So it's the it's Manyara region and the northwest corner of Mbulu district. And this, um, this here, but the picture at the bottom is a photo of some of the compound members. This is a really rural village. Uh, people still practice a predominantly pastoral lifestyle. There's not really much in the way of infrastructure in the village. Okay, uh, this is this is a family tree of the of the household, so you know who's who. Um, the head of the household. So we've got the head of the household. He's a 70 year old man, and he has four wives, two of whom live in the household. Um, the senior wife is uh, she, her daughter-in-law also lives in the compound with all of her children. So that's the left side of the diagram. Um, and then the junior wife on the right-hand side has four children. One of them is at boarding school and the other, three, uh, the other three boys live in, in the case study household. Um, okay, just to say a little bit about this general Swahili knowledge within the household, the, um, the head of the household, very unusually for a, man, for a Datoga man of his age, went to both primary school and secondary school. He then worked briefly as a young man in, in the nearby mission hospital. And then he was very active in local politics um, and was a counselor up until recently. So his Swahili is extremely fluent, um, extremely, extremely good. Um, but he speaks Datoga at home. He's a native speaker of Barabai Datoga. And yeah, when he's talking to his children or his family, he uses Datoga. The senior wife um, hasn't gone to school or anything. Her Swahili is fairly competent. She can make herself understood. Um, it's not, you know, grammatically standard Swahili, but she's got a fairly, fairly large vocabulary. Similarly, the junior wife, um, who's quite a lot younger, she never went to school, but she's picked up Swahili um, over the course of her adult life. I would say she can get by when she's at the market and um, using public transport and so on. The daughter-in-law professes to know absolutely no Swahili whatsoever, uh, which was quite good for me for practicing my Datoga. Um, I imagine she does have a, some passive competence in Swahili, but um, can't speak the language actively. Uh, then the children who are at boarding school, obviously they're being taught uh, in the language by this point. The other children, um, these are the five that I'm mainly focusing on in this study. Um, they can't speak Swahili um, really to any, to any um, meaningful degree, although the, older, the oldest child here is starting to pick up quite a few Swahili phrases. So when are these children hearing Swahili? Well, may, for many children, school would be um, you know, the main route uh, into knowledge of Swahili. Um, but in our case study household, that's, that's not relevant at all. None of the children attend school. However, um, they will be exposed to Swahili from children who do attend school. So uh, their siblings who are at boarding school, when they come home, they might you know, use a few words of Swahili here and there. Um, and their neighboring children who, who do go to school um, may, also bring, may also use some Swahili now and again. So there was one example in, um, in this case study household that there was a neighboring girl who spent quite a lot of time with the children of this household and she went to school, um, to day school. She would come back and she would sing songs in Swahili and sometimes repeat Swahili, uh, recite Swahili numerals um, and things like that. So they were being exposed to Swahili that way. For older children who are responsible for herding livestock, they'll hear Swahili a bit outside of the compound. So while they're herding, when they're going to the well, when they're running errands and so on. Um, for younger children, they're only really going to hear Swahili when it's spoken inside the compound. That'll be by 
visitors such as government officials or missionaries or evangelists who you know do the rounds in the villages um, and when they they're not ethnically de Toga so, so they speak Swahili as the contact language. Um, in this particular household uh, one of the major factors influencing children's exposure to Swahili um, was a temporary resident. He was a young man, uh, a close relative of the family who'd grown up in town and he He's a Datoga person, but he's only got passive knowledge of the language. Um, so he, even though he could understand Datoga a little bit, he would always speak Swahili. Um, and so sometimes the, the women would, would also use Swahili with him. So that was um, perhaps for the youngest children, the kind of main source of their exposure to Swahili. Um, obviously this is like a highly context specific influence in these children's lives. Okay, so Given children's very limited abilities in Swahili, um, we're not finding code switching, except maybe in the case of the oldest girl. Um, so when children do use Swahili words, they're primarily borrowings. So this is, um, this is some data on the number of Swahili words in the speech samples of five children. Um, and as you can see, the, the percentage of Swahili words of borrowings is extremely low. It ranges from one to 4%. Um, and the child who uses the most Swahili borrowings is actually the, the youngest child. Now there's a, there's a simple explanation for that, which is um, that he repeats, sort of insistently repeats uh, Swahili words for food when he's demanding certain types of food. Um, so this is a, a word cloud uh, showing the youngest child's Swahili borrowings. Um, so the larger the word, the, the higher token frequency of that word in, in, this, in his particular sample. Um, so we're getting, you know, rice, soda, sweets, these kinds of Swahili words. And they occurred frequently because he would repeat them um, over and over again. Um, these are all quite special food items that are brought home by his mother on market day or, or by me when visiting. And as for some of the other words there, we'll, we'll have a look at the main semantic domains of borrowings in just a moment. Okay, so in terms of word class, um, the vast majority of Swahili borrowings in, in this sample are nouns. Um, that's unsurprising. They're mostly being used to refer to material items. In terms of the form that these borrowings take, some are pure loan words. Um, perhaps pronounced with the Toga phonology. So for example, Simu in, in Swahili becomes Sim in the Toga. And then we get also some loan blends. So things like Mzungadiand, um, where you've got the Swahili Mzungu and then um, the de Toga nominal morphology there. And I assume that these um, kind of formal patterns derive from adult usage. In terms of uh, the semantics of these borrowings, the majority are additive cultural borrowings that refer to material objects, many of which are relatively new in the Toga lifestyles. Um, so we've got, borrow we've got words referring to technology, things like mobile phone, camera. Um, we've got utensils and tools, so things like spoon, bowl, um, different kinds of food. Uh, clothing was also a um, very frequent source of borrowing, so things like trousers, coat, hat, and so on. Um, and these, you know, these aren't at all surprising. Um, we do also find some examples of replacive borrowing. So that's where children are using a Swahili word, even though there is an equivalent to Toga expression. And we see this, especially with telling the time. Um, so a child might say Sangapi instead of the equivalent to Toga expression. We also find Swahili numbers, even though there would be to Toga equivalents. There are a couple of miscellaneous items like the word for sweet. Um, there is a to Toga form, lao lao, but people seem to, seem to tend to use the Swahili pipi these days. Um, and perhaps the most interesting kind of borrowing that we're finding in this sample is Swahili kinship terms. Um, so I've got examples of mama, bibi, and mjomba in the in the sample, um, and I'll talk about those in a second. So, so how can we account for these replacive borrowings? Well, with numbers, Swahili is typically being used to talk about prices, um, and this is an adult practice that, that children pick up on. So, you know, the context in which adults are talking about money and prices is typically markets, shops, when they might be using Swahili anyway, and that seems to be um, the root of borrowing. So this is just an example of two boys talking about the price of a watch. Um, the first boy asks, um, 
how much is a watch to, to, to his um, older brother. And the, the brother is at boarding school, so he does actually speak Swahili. Um, so he asks, how much is a watch? He uses the, the loan word for watch, um, as we'd expect. And then he says, el fum gapi, um, rather than the Datoba equivalent. And the boy responds, el fum bili, using Swahili. Um, interestingly, the, the same boy then turns to me and asks, what's El Fumbuli in the Datoga language? Um, so, so what's kind of especially interesting is, is that, you know, he's really showing an awareness that this phrase El Fumbuli belongs to a different language. It's clearly making a metalinguistic distinction between the two. And then he did actually offer the, um, you know, the how to say 2000 in Datoga, showing that, you know, he knows how to say it. Um, so the habit of using Swahili for prices is an example of a fairly predictable kind of replacive borrowing. Matras has written about this. Um, many languages borrow numerals strictly in contexts involving economic activity and institutional interaction. And that's what we seem to be seeing here. Perhaps less predictable is the borrowing of kin terms, which as basic vocabulary items, we might expect not to be subject to borrowing or at least close kin. So Matras talks about how um, words for remote kin are more likely to be borrowed than those for close kin. He says that close kin um, words such as daughter, father, etc., are protected by the language of everyday household routines. Um, now, as I said, I've got three examples um, in the spontaneous speech um, of the children. So I've got Bibi, Mama, and Mjomba. Um, kind of just assuming everyone speaks Swahili. So we've got grandma, mother. And, and maternal uncle. Um, in, a di in a different project, I was uh, interviewing some young children about their kinship relations. I interviewed about 65 children about kinship relations. And it really struck me um, how many of them used Swahili to talk about the kinship relations. Um, so I went through and it was about a quarter of them used some Swahili to say, you know, if I asked them, who is this person? Uh, the youngest child to use Swahili in this way was six, uh, and most of them attended school. So I, I've not done any research in Tanzanian schools, but it's possible that, you know, there's some linguistic practices related to kin that might be influencing um, children's use of Swahili here. I'm going to suggest that um, another possibility is that Swahili kin terms are entering Datoba via child-directed speech. So in adult speech, adults aren't using Swahili kin terms. Um, they're using Datogakin terms, with the possible exception of Mjomba uncle, which maybe we can talk about later. Um, but adults do use Swahili kin terms when they're talking to children. Um, so this is an example from my corpus, where a young man um, asks a boy, where's grandma? Go see grandma. And he's speaking to Toga, but he uses the Swahili form Bibi for grandma. Um, and I've also got attested examples of Mjomba, maternal uncle, and Shangazi father's sister um, in my corpus. Uh, and it's, it's always kind of struck me as, as interesting why adults do this when they're talking to children. The one possible explanation is that the phonological simplicity of the Swahili words makes them somehow sort of more suitable for, for a baby talk register. So if we think about a word like BB, um, you know, bilabial, CV, CV structure, very simplistic, compared to the Datoga equivalent, which would be Qambaba or Qamiya. Um, so, so that that might be one thing that's sort of motivating um, adult use of Swahili kin terms in child-directed speech. But it seems to be the child-directed speech that is um, influencing the children's use of these kin terms. So, for example, the child who uttered mjomba um, was clearly repeating it from his mother, who just said it to him earlier. So her her brother was visiting, and she was explaining to her young son, um, "This is." this is your mjomba and for, for whatever reason she was using the, the Swahili term and then the child repeated it over and over again. Another reason that this child was uttering the word mjomba um, has something to do with enjoyment and pleasure and playfulness. So Swahili words seem to be sometimes uttered for their aesthetic quality rather than their usefulness. Um, and what suggests this 
pattern, the rhythm, as well as the fact that these words are uttered in isolation with no offerance or obvious reference points. So I'll just play you um, a couple of examples. So the first one is a boy um, saying the, the Swahili word for sunflower. <laughs> Okay, then we've got this example of Mbyomba. <laughs> and then uh, the final example is, is the word Kabichi Cabbage. <laughs> right, so there seems to be some enjoyment uh, going on here with, with the utterance of these Swahili words. Um, and we also see this playful engagement with Swahili in what I'm calling make-believe Swahili. So this is a playful, usually very brief engagement with Swahili in which children utter Swahili-like words. So finally we get to my title, Hey Boni Kala. This is an example of um, what I'm calling make-believe Swahili. So this is a six-year-old boy. Uh, he's just playing in his mother's house and he directs this little speech to, uh, to his younger brother. So I'll play that. Okay, and I'll just show you a couple of other examples of this kind of make-believe Swahili. So extract three uh, is the same boy again, and actually this one's quite interesting because the um, he had just been exposed to some Swahili maybe like five minutes previously. So the the young man I mentioned who lives in the compound who doesn't speak to Toga, he'd been talking to this boy's mother, um, and then the boy starts using this kind of nonsense Swahili, as it were. <laughs> Uh, okay, and then um, the third example um, is a nine-year-old girl. So this is in the context where I'd, I'd given them some dolls for some other research that I was doing. She was very excited about these dolls. Another child comes in, in the doorway and she says, look at, look at the girls um, in the toga. Then she says, dambir, dambir, jump, jump. And then she kind of uses this sort of, Swahili like expression, so I'll just play that one. Okay, uh, and then the same girl again, here's a, here's a final example. So I've just set up the camera, um, she's commenting in Dutoga, look at the, the bag of the camera, and then, and then we see this make believe, hear this make believe Swahili. <laughs> Okay, so so we we can hear how these children in imitating Swahili sometimes they using actually real Swahili words um, like Rafiki, Bibiako, Vita, Vitu. Um, you know, it's not clear whether the children actually know the meanings of these words or whether they've just heard them. And they're also combining Swahili-like sounds. So we get sequences like this nice astaike, which, you know, really sounds like Swahili, um, unga, ita, suggests that both children are already quite sensitive to Swahili phonotactics, even though they might not be able to speak the language yet. Um, so this, I think this is really interesting data. It's showing, you know, though they can't speak Swahili, there's a clear influence of Swahili in their linguistic behavior. Um, you know, there's, it shows an awareness of another distinct language too, the sort of switching into this, this make-believe language. Um, and I wonder also if, if it shows some awareness of, of Swahili as prestigious, as, as a language that children enjoy imagining that they could speak. In situations where children are growing up multilingual, we know that children do use distinct languages to organize their play. Um, so specific languages might be used to enact specific roles. Amy Poor has written a, a bit about this um, in Dominica where children use Patois and English and they might switch 
they might use English when they're playing being a teacher, whereas they might use Patois when they're playing being an adult farmer, for example. So she writes that code switching practices demonstrate children's emerging sensitivity to how the languages index particular social identities, places, and activities. And also she interestingly briefly mentions um, the use of some nonsense words that resemble patois, uh, although she doesn't really go into much detail on it. In the Datoga case, I would suggest that these creative imitations of Swahili um, perform a, a more ambiguous function um, allowing children to inhabit new indeterminate roles and relationships um, by pushing the boundaries of their own linguistic competence. So it's not like, you know, they're, they're using Swahili to perform a certain role or to, to um, you know, organize their play in, 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 you know, particularly fixed ways. Rather, it's just a sort of uh, imaginary um, attempt at what it would be like to be able to speak Swahili. Okay, some concluding remarks then. So we've seen how the children in this study make only minimal use of Swahili. Um, and as such, you know, we can, we can see that in rural communities, it is still possible to grow up monolingual in Tanzania, though adolescents will no doubt bring exposure to other languages. Um, even though these children speech of, of um, all the children in the study, um, and we're perhaps also seeing replacement of Datoga in certain semantic and pragmatic domains. Um, finally, I would, I would argue that this really interesting phenomenon of make-believe Swahili shows that monolingual children are already developing a keen awareness of a multilingual social landscape. Finally, I just wanted to float the idea that this make-believe Swahili perhaps indicates a sensitivity to the fact that this social landscape is, is an unequal one. Um, so children's nonsense Swahili is a way for them to imagine having a resource that they already see as valuable, um, even though they don't yet have access to it. Uh, okay, thank you very much for your attention. I welcome any questions. Oh, I got my cursor back, hooray. Um, okay, so question number one, um, have you observed any influence of Datoga as a first language on the Swahili that the children produce? Um, A.G. voicing of fricatives. Um, oh yeah, certainly. Um, so I'm just trying to think of some of those examples that I just gave you. Um, well, I'm just thinking that example of Mjomba, um, the child obviously can't, can't quite pronounce the pre-nasal stop yet. He's just going Mjomba. Well, although he gets the, the other bit right. Um, yeah, Mzunga Dyan, Mzunga Dyan, yeah. Yeah, I haven't, um, because they actually don't use much Swahili, you know, I don't have tons of data on that, but certainly something I could, I could look at. Okay, I've got some more questions. Um, any thoughts on why the maternal uncle? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm quite curious about this because as I said, I think that's the one kin term that adults do use in, um, you know, when speaking to other adults. So the, the Datoga word for, there's two words, there's the word ma mai, um, and then the, you can also say um, literally the son of uh, mother's mother, so or da. I think it is. Um, and I think ma my, you probably know this better than me, Martin, might be a borrowing anyway. Um, so I think there's like possibly just some general um, variation in what we call mater maternal mother's brother anyway. Um, and perhaps because of that, people um, are just thinking, right, let's use the Swahili. Um, yeah, okay. Right, interesting. This is fun. Look at all these, these comments flooding in. Um, yeah, so, and, and I have, I wonder if John was just sort of, yeah, I don't know. I don't have a good explanation. Um, Oliver's question, how would you distinguish make-believe Swahili from children's innate sense of making up languages? So I think there is something 
definitely you know broader going on here where children are just very creative with language anyway and even monolingual children might you know make up their own words in their own language um, I think what's different here is that you know we can really see that it's Swahili that they're trying to emulate I mean particularly the older girl you know the the, the forms that she's using are very very Swahili like the younger boy not quite so much as a bit more de toga eyes um, but I think you know, it's not just that it's any language, it's, it's the language that, you know, is, is prestigious. Um, it's the language in, in this contact situation that um, these children might, you know, think is valuable to learn. Um, I'm not familiar with Tolkien's lecture, A Secret Vice, though, that sounds interesting. Yeah, new kind of data for the area. Could you give us some idea of how you carried out the data collection? Uh, yeah, so um, I'm um, a huge fan of uh, spontaneous linguistic data and um, that's kind of the, the main source of data that I collect. So in this case with children, um, there are, you know, slightly different challenges from collecting natural occurring speech with adults. Um, what, I, what I did in, with this case study household is I, so I lived in the household for um, periods of two weeks at a time over the course of, of eight or nine months. Um, so the children got to know me pretty well. And I used, um, I would often focus on times when everyone gets together, so meal times typically, and just put, put the recording device and the camera inside the house. Uh, and that was a very effective way of capturing, you know, natural conversation. Um, uh, with children also, I did have some lapel microphones um, with little bum bags with the recording devices in. That I would strap onto them and then they'd you know go around some of them loved it some of them weren't so keen um and yeah I didn't end up using that quite as much as I thought I would um did the children yeah, that's a really good question whether children um helped me transcribe the place where Healy so no um and and actually it would be very interesting to go back and, and show them and sort of uh, you know ask them about about what they were doing and see if they had any kind of metalinguistic reflection but I did transcribe it with adult de toga and in most cases the, the, the my transcription um, assistant would say oh they're trying to speak Swahili like it was obvious to them oh that's really really interesting yeah I don't know if, if these children have been exposed to anything like that um, Yeah, I mean, I can, the one thing I can think of is, so the head of the household, the, the, the man I mentioned is very good at Swahili, he also speaks some English, because um, from his time at colonial school, and occasionally he would want to practice his English with me, and then one of the older children would even imitate the English, um, which was quite hilarious, like what she thought English sounded like. So it might be that there's this sort of wider practice of imitating other languages that you don't, you don't know, and perhaps that's more likely to kind of occur in a highly multilingual environment like Tanzania. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a really interesting point, Oliver, thank you. I think in this context, there's just not, um, they wouldn't, the children wouldn't have witnessed that kind of thing. <laughs> 